Praise the Lord. If we could turn, please, to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. The fourth part of this sermon series that the Lord has really impressed on my heart, the means to revival. We've looked at the the first session, which was, my head's gone, (laughs) Um, the need for revival, and then we looked at the fruit of revival, and now we're looking finally at the means to revival. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And so, Lord, we come now, Father, and I come, Lord, as a needy soul. God, asking one more time, Lord, for your grace. Lord, asking for your mercies at this time, that, Lord, you would stand with me and give me the words and the burden of your heart to bring to my brothers and sisters this morning. Crown that, Lord, which you have already begun amongst us, that we might see the complete picture, Lord, of revival. In all that you have said, Lord, you are reaffirming to our hearts Through my brother Brian, Lord, a mirror image and an echo, Father, of what you are wanting to do. We cannot but recognize this is your hand. This is your doing. And you have brought us into this holy um, congregation, this gathering together, Lord, of the saints. That, Father, you might minister to us. And so I pray now that you would give us ears to hear, Lord. And that you would do that which only you can do in our midst. We've said it, Lord, and I'll say it again, Lord, this isn't manipulation. God Almighty, whether we raise our voice or whether we whisper, Lord, it makes no difference to thee because your spirit is able and willing, Father, and mighty amongst us. And so I pray now you would bring all glory to this message and that your name, Lord, might be impressed on our hearts this morning. I ask in Jesus' name for your grace. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. The means to revival. The means to revival. In this fourth and final part of this sermon series on the theme of revival, we come at last to dealing with the issue for which all the other sermons preceding it have prepared the way. Having seen firstly the desperate need for revival, and then secondly, the authentic fruit of revival, I believe that we're now in a position to ask ourselves, well, what is the means to revival? In other words, how do we secure to ourselves in this our day, in this our day, the reality of seeing and experiencing firsthand Revival, revival, first hand. Had we stopped short of raising this question so as never to have been provided with an adequate answer based on the authority of God's word in the context of history, I've no doubt that what you have already heard presented, and I mean Brother Brian has already touched on what I'm going to say, um, some of what I'm going to say already, so we're not completely without Um, understanding as to the means of revival, but had I in just my sermon series had stopped short of raising this question so as to have never given you an answer as to how revival comes, we no doubt would have gained for ourselves a burden for revival, praise God, on the correct understanding, the foundation of scripture, and as I said, the history or the records recorded for us in history. Yet I want to say that to possess a knowledge about revival and a burden for revival is not the same thing as experiencing revival. Having an understanding and a knowledge and a burden is good and well, but if we do nothing with it, brothers and sisters, we will remain as we are. Surely is it not that the burden and the knowledge and the understanding all works together to do what? 
to, as a means to provoke us to do something on our part that God on his might come and visit his people. We could have all the knowledge in the world and the experience or rather the understanding and the burden and yet be no more closer than experiencing and seeing true, a true move of God in our midst and to leave off from providing a biblical response as to the means of revival. It is to dangle a juicy carrot before the eyes of a hungry people whilst holding the stick at such a distance so that seeing it they may never be able to obtain it. And I want to say that this will never do. We failed in our job if, if, we, if I was to leave you with simply a burden and an understanding and not from the word of God provoke and equip you as to the means by which God might in his mercy and sovereignty send revival. Whilst there are some for whom revival is nothing more than a sentimental love affair with the nostalgias of the past, the aim of me pouring out my heart, which has been months of preparation as God has burdened and prepared my own heart for this conference, it has not been to this romanticized end that we might leave this room with some nostalgic love for revival. But rather it is to set forth in your hearing the possibility of us experiencing revival. A true move of God in our midst that we might cry from our hearts, do it again, O Lord, do it again. I make no apology for what I have said throughout and I'll say again just two words, unless God, unless God, unless God rends the heavens and comes down to visit his people, this spiritually parched land with an outpouring of the rains of revival, then I want to say simply we finished. The future of our nation is non-existent. And I would dare and tremble to see that in my dying days should the Lord tarry what things will be like on this earth. Should the Lord give me length of days. It is going to be unbearable. In the last decade alone, the immorality in the walls have broken down and we've been flooded with every form of in 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 immorality and iniquity. Our children are being defiled. Strong men who've stood for years are crumbling under the pressure of the immorality that's coming upon this land. And unless God in his sovereignty and his mercy sees fit to pour revival out beginning on his church and bringing in a conscious awareness of God amongst the unsaved to bring them in, then this place is going to be hell on earth in 20 to 30 years. May God have mercy. May God have mercy. There's simply no other way by natural means that we can redeem ourselves from the darkness that has enveloped our nation. I want to say that again. There's simply no other way through natural means, please hear me on that, that we can redeem ourselves as a country and as a church from the darkness which has enveloped our nation. And the greatest fear that I have as I close this session and we complete this final day is that upon leaving, we would all go back to our respective places and say that was a good conference. That was a nice few days of blessing and by Friday we've forgotten all about what God has been impressing on our heart these last two days. Oh God, may you deliver us from this superficiality which only ever seems to scratch the surface of our flesh and it leaves the true heart unscathed and untouched. I would to God that he would lay the scalpel to our hearts and, and dig deep and impressed deep into our hearts that we would not just leave saying this was a good conference, but we would leave carrying the burden of the Lord out with us to our respective places and begin to pray, begin to pray that God might have mercy upon this nation. That is my heart's burden. Not only that God would give us mercy drops here while we gathered that would cause us to long for the showers of revival, but that we would leave with a God-given burden to begin to pray unbelief put underfoot and saying lord you are more than able to do this again things aren't that bad that you cannot revive the lord god we need you and we need a god-given burden that only you can give i want you to consider nehemiah he was the cupbearer to the king of persia he inquired of Hanani concerning the jews remember he was in captivity 
And the Jews were there, gathered some of them back into the land. They were there, left of the captivity. And news came back how it was that his brethren were faring and how Jerusalem, that city that once stood in glory, but now lay in ruins. And we read in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 3, the remnants that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. And upon hearing this news, he whose countenance had before been glad, upon hearing of this devastating news, he was overcome by a deep sorrow. Look at the perilous circumstances of the hour. They were conducive to his brokenness. Conducive to his brokenness. And I simply ask my brothers and sisters, in like manner, is there not a cause in our day? Is there not a cause that we should be grieved over the condition of the church and over the condition of our nation? The Lord, it seems, has given us over to our enemies on every hand. The church is puny and powerless in our day to affect a world for Jesus Christ. And as Brian so wonderfully put as the Lord led him, that we've resorted to the muck of this world to try and draw them in because our own wells are dry and barren and empty. May God have mercy. May Lord, the Lord have mercy. The wall is truly broken down, saints, as it was in the days of Nehemiah. And the people of God are in great affliction as it was in the days of Nehemiah. What was Nehemiah's response? Turn with me, please, to Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4. We're talking about the means to revival. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4. I'll read from verse 3 again. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I want to ask you a question. How does one learn to weep and to mourn? Where is the textbook that can teach us how to weep and teach us how to mourn? Either we're broken and on account of that we will mourn and weep or we're not. And we can try for all our many efforts, but it will produce no avail to nothing. By what reading and what training can we learn to weep and mourn? This wasn't a performance on Nehemiah's part, you understand. There was a burden to pray and a burden and a grief that gripped his heart that I want to say I believe was ultimately given to him by God. I want to say that. And so what then ought our response be? Lord, if I haven't that burden, give me that burden. I'm not trying today to say, look, we have to somehow work this up. Either we're grieved or we're not. But if we're not, then we can be honest before the Lord and say, Lord, my heart's untouched. Will you begin to give me a burden? And will you begin to break my heart? Because as you look at the history of revival, there's one thing that clearly is there, that God is the great initiator. And before he moves his people to pray, he moves his people with a burden that is given from him. This is clear. What I'm going to be sharing with you this morning pertaining to the means of revival cannot be understood apart from the sovereignty of God. I emphasize that again. This isn't manipulation. This isn't me and Brother Brian and those that have spoken and addressed you trying to whip something up. You can find many churches like that. Preachers who can have everyone in tears and then in the next minute everyone roaring with laughter. Yeah. We've not come to personalities. We've not come to a stage show. 
Only the Lord God of heaven can give his people the burden that we need to begin to be moved to pray for revival. And I understand my limitations. I cannot do that. God only can do that apart from his sovereignty. We're doomed and we can do nothing. But I believe the Lord has brought us together. And I believe God is already at work in many of your hearts and indeed in my heart also. In bringing us to this place. In first seeing the need for the revival. That God would give us the burden so that then we might begin to pray Now I understand man certainly has his part to play, but when everything is said and done, God is the great initiator of revival, working behind the scenes to move his people to pray. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. God gives the burden for revival and that burden is expressed in prayer. Always expressed in prayer. The outlet for anything in our Christian walk is the expression of prayer. That our hearts are moved and our lips then begin to utter prayers unto the Lord. What is prayer? But a simple declaration, Lord, we need you. No fancy stuff. Just simply, Lord Almighty God, help. As Brother Brian shared, help me, Jesus. I want to say that humility and prayer go hand in hand like a hand in a glove, like bread and butter. And the proud man does not pray and will not pray. Why? Because he genuinely senses no need for God in his life. If there's a need and then we do something about it, if my stomach is hungry, then I go to the fridge and prepare food. If my car is empty on the fuel, then out of the need, I go to the petrol station and fill it up. And likewise, Christian, if there is a need in your life and you sense that need, then to your knees you will go and you will begin to pray. You will begin to cast that burden onto the Lord. But I want to say that the proud man sees no need for God and therefore on account of it, having trust in himself and sufficiency within himself, he really senses no need for prayer and no more greater is this epitomized than in the Western world. You see, those in the third world country pray for God for their next meal. We in the West go to our refrigerators and we can't help that. We're thankful for God for what he's given to us. But what I'm saying to you, this is the temptation to suddenly become self-sufficient and no longer sense our need for God. But there's always a need for God. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The proud man senses no need for God in his life and says, I can do it alone. And it is not even dawned upon him that he needs God for his every breath. But a God-given burden brings a man to his knees and turns his eyes heavenward to seek the Lord in prayer. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. It's been said by that great expositor, Matthew Henry, and by the way, he was born about three miles up the road from Whitchurch, from where we're meeting here today, a Shropshire man. He said, when God intends great mercy for his people, the first thing he does is to set them a praying When God, the great initiator, intends great mercy, see the one who intends it for us, God, the first thing he does is to set his people a praying. Where were the disciples found before the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? And what were they found doing? And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, Acts 1.14. There's no two ways about it. You can search the annals of history, if you will, but I'm convinced that they will reveal this single testimony that no revival has come without there first being a concerted effort on the part of God's people to pray. Every single revival, we've heard of it there in the Hebrides, God moved his people with a God-given burden and that burden was expressed in prayer, 
in prayer. And Lord, would you begin there? Do that amongst us, we ask. I'm going to read here a testimony, the secret of the Welsh revival. It's taken again from Arthur Wallace's book, In the Day of Thy Power. He writes, early in the Welsh revival of 1904, a Wiltshire evangelist visited the meetings at Ferndale. He stood up and said, friends, I have journeyed into Wales with the hope that I may glean the secret of the Welsh revival. And in an instant, Evan Roberts was on his feet and with an uplifted arm towards the speaker, he replied, my brother, there is no secret. Ask and ye shall receive. Praise the Lord. Prayer, revival and prayer go hand in hand. The great revival awakening and re awakening, and awakening of 1858 saw at its height 50,000 converts a week being added to the church. J. Edwin Orr, he was an authority on the history of revival. He gives a moving account of the role that prayer played in that revival, in its beginnings and indeed throughout its course. He writes, in September 1857, a man of prayer, Jeremiah Lamphia, started a businessmen's prayer meeting in the upper room of the Dutch Reformed Church consistory building in Manhattan. In response to his advertisement, only six people out of a population of a million showed up. But the following week, there were 14 and then 23. And when it was decided to meet then every day for prayer, by late winter, they were filling the Dutch Reformed Church, then the Methodist Church on John Street, then Trinity Episcop um, Episcopal Church on Broadway at Wall Street. And in February and March of 1858, every church and public hall in downtown New York was filled. What were they doing? They were praying for Revival, a sovereign act of God as he moved his people to begin to pray, having a sense and a burden that God was not only able to revive, but was willing to revive, else he would never have moved their hearts to begin to pray. Horace Gre Greeley, the famous editor, sent a reporter with horse and buggy racing round the prayer meetings to see how many men were praying. In one hour, he could only get to 12 meetings, but he counted 6,100 men in attendance. Then a landslide of prayer began, which overflowed to the churches in the evenings. People began to be converted, 10,000 a week in New York City alone, and the movement spread throughout New England. The church bells bringing people to prayer at 8 in the morning, 12 noon, and 6 in the evening. Prayer and revival, my brothers and sisters, go hand in hand. My brothers and sisters, will we not humble ourselves? Humble ourselves and seek the face of God that he might have mercy upon us. If my people, which are called by my name, notice where the emphasis is placed. Is it placed on the politicians? Is it placed on those who are trying to negotiate a means for us to get out of Brexit? No. Where is the focus of the people? Or who is the people that are, uh, that are moved by God if my people? Who are called by my name? It's the people that belong to God that are calling upon his name. And if that's the case, then why are we looking to the politicians to sort the mess out in our nation? God can use politicians. History bears that out. But our eyes are on the Lord and he will do in his sovereignty what, our, what he wills. Can God use such means? He can. But the call goes out for his people to seek his face. My brothers, humility and prayer. My sisters, humility and prayer. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, the psalmist writes, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Is that the heart cry of your heart? My help comes from the Lord. Psalm 121 and verses 1 and 2. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves 
and pray and seek my face. My brethren, there's something about humility that moves the heart of God. We've heard this already. It moves the heart of God to exercise mercy. There's something about a proud man in the face of God which he is caused to stand aloof from. But I don't care how sunken a man is and how in utter despair a man is. There's something when a man chooses to humble himself that moves the heart of God in his mercy to exercise loving kindness. It's just there throughout scripture. The secret to the heart of God, my friends, is brokenness and humility. The strong man he resists. But the man or the woman that is willing to humble themselves before God and cry out for his mercy. The Lord's mercy like an avalanche will come upon such people. That is hope. To this man will I look in Isaiah 66 and verse 2. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. God resisteth the proud, Peter writes in 1 Peter 5 and verses 5 and 6. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. My friends, there's nothing that we can do except to humble ourselves before God. There's nothing that we can give to the Lord but humble ourselves before God. Humble yourselves, therefore, on account that God gives grace to the humble and resisteth the proud. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. The cry of God's people in the prayer for revival is, O oh Lord, humble us. We come in brokenness and our need for you is great. Lord, will you have mercy? In the famous words of Evan Roberts, bend me, bend me. That was the slogan of the 1904 Welsh revival. Bend the church and save the world. Bend the church and save the world. Will we not get honest before God this morning and acknowledge on this point, Lord, I confess in the area of prayer, Lord, I've taken my eye off the ball. In the area of prayer, Lord, I'm bankrupt and my storehouse is empty. There are some who view prayer as a merit system where if we can get our notches in for the day, somehow God is pleased with us. Look, the Lord doesn't need our prayers. We need him, which is why we pray. He doesn't need our prayers. He has everything that he could ever need and require is self-sufficient in and of himself. He's the eternal creator of the heavens. He doesn't need us. We need him. And therefore we come to pray. Amen. Who turns prayer into some religious chore? Yeah. The humble people pray because they sense their need for God. And the yeah. proud men do not because they are self-sufficient. Will we not get honest before the Lord and say, God, I've got no burden for revival. I'm self-seeking, I'm self-absorbed, and I've no burden for, for your glory, Lord, to see you move again upon this land. And say, oh God, I humble myself as best as I know how, and I beseech you, Lord, will you begin to give me a burden? A burden for souls, and a burden for your church, and a burden for glory for your glory, and praying faith to believe you for revival. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. But it doesn't stop there, he continues, and, and that and is important, and turn from their wicked ways. Then, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. By way of context, the words of 2 Chronicles 7.14 belong to a passage that spans some two chapters. The whole length of chapter 7, chapter 6 as well. King Solomon, if you remember, had finished the dedicating of the temple. And the tremendous glory of God had come so that the priests were no longer able to stand. The presence of God came and filled the temple. And as we turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, please, and verses 1 through to 3. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verses 1 through to 3. 
We read these awesome words. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Amen. Before the building of this temple, bricks and mortar, but then the glory of God came into that house and came amongst his people and the response was nothing less than that they bowed themselves to the ground under the awesome presence of God and worshipped and praised the Lord saying for he is good for his mercy endureth forever this is revival praise the Lord in verse 12 the Lord appeared to Solomon by night by night and he said unto him, I've heard your prayer. He was given a response because Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 at the consecration of the temple had prayed to God. And here we see in verse 12, the Lord says in, one, in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 12, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I've heard your prayer. I've heard your prayer. And I've chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. In verse 13, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, this was a response to Solomon's prayer, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, notice the one who did it, God, as a chastening against his wayward people if they went astray. God says, if this should happen, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. In its immediate context, I understand verse 14 has to do with the promise given to Solomon relating to the restoration of the land and the reviving again of Israel. Should they turn away from God and God visit them with the judgments of Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. If they should turn away from God, then God in his love will chasten his people. But God says to Solomon, there is a way back. There is a way back if my people, sensing the hand of judgment against them, not attributing it to this faulty politician and that faulty politician, not attributing it to Islam and to those in the gay lobby and to the, and to the left. You see, we've got the fingers pointing in the wrong places. They should be pointing first at us. Yes. If my people, <laughs> recognizing that these judgments have come upon our nation on account of the backsliding of this nation and the backsliding of the church within this nation, if my people, sensing their desperate need and the hand of God against them will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will heal their land, will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Though applying to national Israel, we can nonetheless draw from this verse principles for revival. Principles for revival. Predicated not only on this verse, but the wealth of scripture, the entirety of the Bible, it's the same in every case. God's people go away from him. The way back, turn from your wicked ways. Humble yourself, seek my face, and come back to me. And God will restore his people. 
Before God sent revival to the Isle of Lewis in 1949, he began to move a small group of believers to pray. I want you to hear firsthand, we heard some of it on the video clip yesterday, the events that transpired. One night, one of the sisters had a vision. Now remember, in revival, God works in wonderful ways. A vision came to one of them, and in the vision, she saw the church of her fathers crowded with young people packed to the doors, and a strange minister standing in the pulpit. She was so impressed by the vision that she sent for the parish minister. And of course, he, knowing the two sisters, knowing that they were two women who knew God in a wonderful way, responded to their invitation and called at the cottage. That morning, one of the sisters said to the minister, you must do something about this. And I would suggest that you call your elders together and that you spend at least two nights with us in, a prayer, in prayer a week, Tuesday night and Friday night. If you gather your elders together, you can meet in a barn or, in, or a farming community. And as you pray there, we will pray here. Well, that was what happened. The minister called his elders together, thanked God for his obedience and the leading of the spirit to two elderly women who in much of today's circles may have just simply been overpassed. Who are they? Surely the old ones don't have anything to contribute. But yet God, of course, every single soul does. Well, this is the society we're living in. We just escort the older, elderly out of the door and it's all about the young folk. No. The hoary head full of wisdom, right. experience, and depth with God is the backbone of any church. And a church that has them is rich, is rich. Well, that was what was happened. The minister called his elders together and seven of them met in a barn to pray on Tuesday and Friday. And the two old women got on their knees and prayed with them. That continued for some weeks. In fact, I believe almost a month and a half. Then one night as they were kneeling in the barn and pleading this promise, I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. A certain young man, a deacon in the church, got up and read Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessings of the Lord. And then the young man closed his Bible and looking down at the minister and the elders, he spoke these crude words to him, but perhaps not so crude in our Gaelic language. It seems to me to be so much humbug to be praying as we are praying, to be waiting as we are waiting, if we ourselves are not rightly related to God. And then he lifted his two hands and prayed, God are my hands clean, is my heart pure? But he got no further. The young man fell to his knees and fell into a trance. Now don't ask me to explain this because I can't. He fell into a trance and was now lying on the floor of the barn. And in the words of the minister, at that moment, he and the other ministers were gripped by the conviction that a God-sent revival must ever be related to holiness and godliness. Are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? This is the man whom God will trust. This is the woman whom God will trust with revival. That was the conviction. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. One cannot divorce revival from holiness. We've been saying that all along. And if we are going to seek the Lord as I trust by God's grace, we will. And I don't know how he's going to do it, my brethren. I rejoiced so much because of all the different people that were coming to this conference. 
I think more than 80% of my own fellowship or the Lord's fellowship that I pastor, precious friendships across the country, pastors here from across other fellowships, from all across the country, God has brought together. And I don't believe that the revival that's going to come can be contained to a denomination, but a community of believers that are desiring truth network together by love and the fear of God. And that God in our respective places are going to begin to move our churches to pray. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that. Praise the Lord. But I want to say if we're going to get serious about seeking the face of the Lord for a heaven sent revival out of a God given burden. Then we must be willing to get serious with God in the area of personal holiness. We must, because I'm telling you that without it, there will be no use in us praying. There will be no use in us lifting our voices. We could arrange a prayer meeting every night of the week. Lord, is my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And this is something that I spent some time not long ago just getting away with our family and spending time seeking the Lord. And the Lord really pulled me up about this matter. Is the door shut in every single area of known sin in your life? And I had to acknowledge before the Lord that whilst, yes, Lord, to the best of my knowledge, but Lord, it's the cracks open ever so slightly. And there's things, Lord, from time to time that I'm willing to overlook. And the Lord said, no more. Shut that door of sin. If you are going to be a means by which to stand and to pray and to seek my face through revival, you must shut the door on sin. Amen. I must close that door that not even it's open a crack. My brothers and sisters, the door of sin in our lives must be shut. God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? We cannot escape this fact. Not only prayer preceded by humility, but prayer proceeded by holiness. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up the fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord. Is there not a cause, my brothers and sisters? Come on. The Lord is wanting to move his church on to maturity. He's not behind us with a whip, you understand? He's so gracious, he's leading us and saying, come and follow me. But I'm telling you, he's leading us to the hill of holiness. He's leading us to Calvary, there we, whereby we might be cleansed from our sin and knowing the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, be free from the power of sin. The Lord is calling his people up higher. It's all I seem to have a burden on my heart of late. God is calling his people to maturity. And there's some in this room today that I'm praying as you leave this conference, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And you leave out of here and say no more. From this day on, I'm going to walk in victory and I am going to be a mature Christian. This is the heart of God. Because the Lord cannot trust his things with immaturity. He wants his people to come to a place of maturity and to deal with besetting sins that continually to ensnare us that we know about and we willingly turn the blind eye to. God is saying to his people, come up higher. Be done with these things. Close the door on it because there are greater things in which to cast our eyes on. The Lord wants to do something in his land. And as Brian says, he doesn't need us, but we are the means by which he desires to use in which revival might come. And we cannot pray half-heartedness. We cannot pray in a prayer meeting and then go back to worldliness. This oscillation has to stop. The Lord wants consistency that his people might come onto higher ground. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground for it's time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. What is the fallow ground that needs breaking up in your life? And I would to God, as has been said, that he would give us tender consciences that feel the slightest touch of uncleanness. 
This isn't legalism, my brethren, please. There's some here who have been under heavy shepherds and they've whipped them from the front and said, if you don't come to church every week and give to the offering and read your Bible every day, whip, whip, whip. I'm telling you, the Lord isn't a harsh taskmaster. And the last thing in my heart is to put a, 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 a guilt trip on any of you. Look. The Lord is willing and the Lord is able, but he requires our hearts. There's nothing in our own strength. All comes from him. But we must make the decision and purpose with our hearts. Lord, we want to go on with you. And God will give us the grace and the means to do it. Lord, start the work of revival in me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me, lead me into the way everlasting. Psalm 139 and verses 23 and 24. I want you to consider the nature of Nehemiah's prayer. If we go back, please, to Nehemiah chapter 1 and verses 5 through to 11. Nehemiah chapter 1. And verses 5 through to 11. Having a God-given burden and mourning for certain days, fasting and praying before the Lord. We have recorded here his prayer. <coughs> and he said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad amongst the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though um, though there, there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah firstly appeals to the covenant mercies of a covenant-keeping God. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, in verse 5, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Our God is a covenant keeping God, which is why he hates it when marriages break down, divorce and remarriage he hates. Because we see from the word of God that he himself is faithful, a covenant keeping God. And Nehemiah firstly appeals to the covenant mercies of this covenant-keeping God. And I want to say, do we not still serve such a God? A covenant-keeping God? Now I understand that Nehemiah appealed to the covenant that God had made with Moses. The promises contained within it of blessing and curses, as I said in Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. I accept and I understand that we have been delivered from the old covenant. That's not to say that the Lord cannot take a promise that was for Israel and in his mercy and divine grace make it a promise unto us. They held on to promises in the Hebrides revival and, they, and the Lord impressed it on their hearts that he was wanting to do something amongst them. But we are in a better covenant, in a new covenant. 
And as we look to the new covenant, is it not still that there are promises there that God is able to meet his people in revival? Look at this in Matthew 16 and verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do you believe that? Jesus said, let the devil do his worst. He shall never prevail against my church. And so, Lord, I understand it appears that the devil is running roughshod all over your church. But I stand on the word of God. The gates of hell shall not prevail against your church. Lord, restore your church at this hour to its glory. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, is he not able? And present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jude verse 24. Do you know, gathered around the throne of Christ is going to be a people whose testimony is that Jesus has kept them from falling and has kept them faultless. But Lord, it doesn't appear that it's that way. Lord, revive your church. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, Paul said, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. And in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, these scriptures tell of a glorious church. Paul desired to present them and indeed believed that he would present them as a chaste virgin to Christ. And Lord, it seems your people are unfaithful in this day, but Lord, you're able to revive them. There will be a perfect and a perfect chaste bride presented to Christ that is coming. I don't care how things may seem, the Lord is able. Amen. And in revival, he restores his church to that former glory. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Hus um, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he may sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that, look, he might present it to himself a glorious church. This is the heart of God, and God will have a glorious church presented to his son at his appearing. He will. He will. Lord, have mercy. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I could list many more beside. We've heard Brian share, you know, that if we ask anything in his name, believing he will do it. The importune woman widow in, in, in Luke chapter 18. Men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to lose heart. Persistent prayer. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I could list many more beside, but this is sufficient to tell us what? That for us to simply accept things as they are and to sleep easy at night and say, ah, oh, well, it's just the end times, is not what the scriptures would desire. Jesus is coming back for a glorious church, and aren't we jealous yes. over the condition of the church to say, Lord, it's not acceptable? It's not acceptable the way the church is in this hour. Lord, you're coming back soon. Come back for a glorious church. Amen. Revive your church, O oh God. Amen. And may God give us that holy jealousy for his things. We see also in Nehemiah the confession and the admission of sins corporately in verses 6 and 7. And I've nearly finished. In Nehemiah... Chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7. Let thine eye now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the cry of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly. So Nehemiah identifies himself with his people. Look, there are church brothers and sisters in Christ all across their country, this country, and many of them are backslidden <coughs> in churches that we wouldn't want to step foot in. But is it acceptable that we stand outside and point the finger and laugh at them? No. No. It's not our heart grieved. These are our brothers and sisters, some of them. 
and they're in desperate measures. I was hearing, I forgot who it was from, but it was from Brother Aaron. He was sharing about the younger generation, that all they've ever known is what they've come into. Their right hand hardly knows the difference from their left. Is it not that our hearts should be grieved? Have mercy on the blind and the deaf, Lord. And we associate ourselves with their sins and say, Lord, collectively, have mercy on your church. Have mercy on your church. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which you commanded to your servant, Moses. I want to, in finishing then, to draw your attention just to one more aspect as we pray for revival. We've looked at the burden of prayer, the humility of prayer, consecration in prayer, and faith in prayer. And yet there's one final aspect that I want to bring out, which is a common thread when God desires to bring a revival, and it's this, unity in prayer. Unity in prayer. If my people, not just those living in Jerusalem or those living in this locale, if my people... And so this idea of denominationalism where we only stick with our own just has to go. And I'm not talking about ecumenism, of course. We do not desire to unite with those that support Catholicism and deny the gospel, no. But I'm talking about those who desire truth. Such as us amongst here, represented from many different fellowships and house groups that have gathered together. I count myself as your brother. You're my family in Christ, just as much as my local fellowship and my family. I recognize the unity amongst the body of Christ. We serve the same Lord. And when God desires to revive, denominational barriers go down. And people contending earnestly for the faith and love of the truth meet together. And begin to pray. It's not about our church in Wolverhampton. And your church over in Lincoln. Or your church down in the south. No. It's about us recognizing we are the body of Christ. Yes, and that we desire God to revive his people en masse. Yes, amen. En masse. Amen. And I would long to hear. Look, for instance brother Jason get on the phone and say. Brother the Lord's broken out down in this fellowship. Oh <laughs> praise the Lord. It would provoke us. Brethren, let's get on our knees. Lord, do the same amongst us. There's a genuine desire amongst the body of Christ and a unity in us coming together. And when the day of Pentecost was was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Acts 2.1. Oftentimes in the history of revival, it was disunity within the body that hindered revival. Disunity within the body, competitive spirits and striving amongst denominations and churches. God would have none of this. And whilst, as I said, we certainly stand against the subversive schemes of ecumenism, we must be careful that we do not end up standing against the true people of God because they don't necessarily come to our place of worship. Our desire is for the true body of Christ and not only our little sect. God looks for a man as he did in the days of Ezekiel. I'm going to read this verse and finish. Ezekiel chapter 22. I'll read this verse and finish. Ezekiel chapter 22. And verses 30 and 31. God is looking for a man. God is looking for a woman. And I sought for a man, and as our brother said, we could add a woman, a man or a woman among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But here's the tragedy. But I found none. I found no one to stand in the gap. Therefore, I have poured out mine indignation upon them, I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed unto their heads, saith the Lord God. Thank God that Israel had a Moses who was willing to say to God, who knew the art of intercession, blot me out of your book, Lord. But don't destroy this people. Your great name is at stake. God says he looks for a man and in the days of Ezekiel he could not find one. 
He desires a man or a woman to stand in the gap that they might avert the judgment and wrath of God, pleading for the mercies of God that he might spare a people. Will you stand in that gap? Will I stand in that gap? Lord, begin, you've begun the work of, of a burden for revival. Continue to fan the flames, Lord. Honestly, I pray that for myself. I don't want to leave this conference in a month from now. This, is, this was just a conference. Lord, please, the Lord has been working in my heart over a number of months. I used to have a great burden for revival, and there was a number of years where it, it just dissipated. But the Lord has begun to fan the flames again of my heart for revival, and I don't want it to let it go this time. I want to lay hold on God. Bring a revival in me, a local revival in our fellowship, a regional revival, a nation revival. According to your faith, let it be done. Yes. I don't always have the faith. I can't picture how a, na a national revival is going to come. But with what God has given me to believe him for, you can revive me, Lord. And I know you're able to revive our church, and I know you're able to revive the nation. I just don't quite understand how. But, Lord, you are able. And bit by bit, to the measure that God gives us, we're faithful in him. He will increase the burden to believe him for more. Will we not consider what the end will be if the Lord should not send revival? Will we stand in the gap, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubt, that God may spare a nation ripe for judgment? Do it again, O Lord, do it again. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be gracious. We've poured everything that I have had, Lord, within me, that you have given, Lord. And now, Father, we commit it to you and ask that you will do what you will do, Father, and that you would, Lord, leave a lasting impression in every one of our hearts. And as Brian comes, Lord, to finish the final session, oh, God, speak to us. We thank you that you already have and that you have gathered us together because you are wanting to do something, Lord. What great hope does this put in our hearts? This isn't just a good idea. This is God's idea, God's burden, God's heart for a nation. I look for a man to stand in the gap that the judge, my judgment might be averted. And the sorrowful thing is I found none. May it not be said on this generation, Lord, that there was no one to stand in the gap. Use us, Lord. We want to become mature now, Lord. Gone are the times of our baby days, Lord. You're wanting to bring us up now to responsible adults in Christ. Spiritually mature to shoulder the burden that is required that only a mature Christian can shoulder. Give us that grace, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.